Hello and welcome Joy friends to Cup to Hook Bible Chats. My name is Cynthia with Cynthia's Joy Creations and today we are going to look at Galatians chapter 2 and it is entitled Paul Defends the Gospel of Grace. And before we get started, um, we are going to open up with a word of prayer and if you will just go ahead and bow your heads. We're going to have just a quick moment of silence for you just to ask God to help clear away any distractions that might keep you from being able to listen to the message that he wants you to receive today. Let's pray. Father God, we just open up our hearts and our minds to you right now. You have sent your servant Paul to preach the gospel Lord and right now he might be writing to all the Christians in the churches of Galatia but Lord as Christians living in the world today there is much to be learned from these letters and from the importance of the message that he is trying to get across that the gospel is what it is and it stands firm and it stands strong. Lord, open our hearts and remove all distractions so that we can fully grasp the message that you want us to hear today. We love you and we ask all this in your name and your son's name. Amen. Okay, so chapter 2 has a total of 21 verses. So again, it's not a very... Um, big chapter. We have a lot of excitement that's going to unfold in this chapter. It's going to be almost like a, a scene right out of a movie. So if you're ready, then let's go ahead and get started. And we are going to start with verses 1 through 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and a meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was running and had not been running my race in vain. All right. First thing is, so it's now been 14 years between chapter 1 and chapter 2, okay? All right. He says he's gone up into Jerusalem, and he's taken with him Barnabas and Titus. Barnabas is a respected leader among the leadership in Jerusalem, so he's highly regarded. Titus is a Gentile convert. And he's a remarkable man and associate of the Apostle Paul. Paul loves and trusts Titus and regards him as a valuable associate. Alright, we're going to pick up with verse 3. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Going into verse 6. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were, makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. All right, so we're going to stop there at the end of verse 7. So let's talk for a minute. So he's got Barnabas and Titus with him as he's going into Jerusalem. Titus is a Gentile convert, okay? So that means he's not a Jew, and he's not been circumcised. And Paul has not compelled him 
to be circumcised because you do not have to be circumcised to be saved. And so therefore, he did not insist that Titus do this. Well, because of that, some chatter arose and some false believers started spying on them and trying to stir up trouble. And, Peter, and, and Paul is saying, we did not give in to them, not even for a moment. Okay? Because the issue of Titus being circumcised has nothing to do with the gospel, has nothing to do with the sharing of it, has nothing to do with believing. So, in other words, he's not going to engage in a fight that's not worth fighting. And we can learn from that. Sometimes we get involved in situations that we just have no business being in. There's no reason that we have to fight the fight. There's no reason we have to be right or wrong. But we choose to get involved in something and exhaust ourselves when we didn't even have to get involved in the first place. And Paul is showing such great wisdom and maturity by saying, we didn't engage in it. We didn't come a part of the, the chatter. And then he goes, and as, and as for those who were held in high esteem, meaning that they were influential Christians, you know, they were famous, people knew who they were, their leadership was recognized. He says, they add nothing to this for me. Because God doesn't show favoritism. Whatever your rank or status is doesn't matter. What matters is your heart, your salvation. You can be the President of the United States. But if you're not a Christian, being President is not going to save you. So Paul didn't care what their ranking was. He says, it doesn't add anything to my message. On the contrary, though, he says, they recognize that I have been entrusted with the task of teaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter to the circumcised. So, basically, Barnabas and all of them had a hand his, his colleague, in making the decision and recognizing who he was, who, where his leadership was at, and they said, okay, you go preach the gospel to the Gentiles, those that are uncircumcised. And Barnabas and Peter and all of us, we're going to preach to the Jews who are circumcised. All right. Let's look at verses 8 through 13. For God who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James Cephas, otherwise known as Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, meaning high up in the leadership, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me and they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, which is the very thing I have been eager to do all along. All right. So the leadership of Jerusalem has accepted Titus even though he wasn't circumcised. And this shows that the leadership accepted the gospel of grace as Paul understood it. Circumcision had no bearing on salvation and therefore did not force the Gentiles to cut away the male foreskin. So now... 
Paul is like, I'm trying to find out. Am I running this race in vain? Have you really not given me permission and recognition to share the gospel with these Gentiles? Are you going to continue to segregate them and treat them differently? He's like, because you came together with me. You gave authority for me to do this. If the scriptures said Gentiles would be saved, why did so many Jews have a problem with it then? Jewish tradition taught that contact with Gentiles made one ceremonially unclean. Sharing a meal or entering the home of a Gentile was particularly forbidden. And this has to do with them seeing circumcision as being unclean. It makes a person unclean. Therefore, their home is unclean. Therefore, they are unclean. And in their minds, not able to be saved. But thank God God does not work that way. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to look at verses 11 through 13. When Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men who came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Okay, so what did I just read? All right, first off, Peter was in previous agreement with accepting the Gentiles and welcoming them into the church without bringing them under the law of Moses, the Mosaic law. Okay, which was all men had to be circumcised. But when he came to Antioch, which is Paul's home church, okay, it was another story. And he refused to even associate with the Gentile Christians. Once certain Jewish believers came. Now, he treated these Gentile Christians like they weren't even Christians at all. And Paul has a public confrontation with Peter over the issue. This is occurring at the church's potluck dinner. Peter is the honored guest. Okay. All right. They took communion at this dinner, and it's possible that Peter turned the Gentiles away and didn't even allow them to participate in the communion. And even though Peter knew that God welcomed the Gentiles, he feared the members of the embassy that were there visiting as well would go back and tell the Jerusalem church that he was not only eating with the Gentiles, okay, but that he accepted them as Christians. And he was afraid that this would compromise his position in the church. So, as Paul pointed out, he was a hypocrite. Well, Barnabas is Paul's trusted friend and associate. And he was with Paul when he first met with the apostles, which they listed, James, Peter, and John, and they brought him to Antioch to actually help with the ministry there. I mean, they specifically brought him to Antioch. So what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is one who puts on a mask, who pretends to be something he's not, or he pretends to be something he is. But it's one who puts on a mask. And Peter was definitely being a hypocrite. 
you don't get to walk amongst these people and treat them like equals and brothers and sisters. And then when your bosses are looking, so to speak, your colleagues, your friends, and then that like, pfft, what are you doing? How dare you talk to me? You can't eat at the same table as me. You can't even be in this place of establishment. What is wrong with you? And the Gentiles were confused and shocked and hurt. Someone they cared deeply about was acting like they were disgusting. They were not even fit to eat the same food that he was eating. In fact, he probably told them they couldn't even eat in there, that they had to leave. And if they got to stay, they had to sit at their own table. What does that make you feel like? What does that make you think of? Middle school, high school, where you couldn't sit at certain tables it belonged to the popular kids or the band geeks or the debate club or the cheerleaders and the football players maybe you were one of those tables and you didn't let somebody sit with you to some degree we all know what this feels like we can all picture this scenario social pressure pushes us to compromise in a certain way because we're afraid of what someone might think maybe we're trying to impress somebody and even though we don't believe in something that they believe in we're gonna respond so that we're light maybe they're picking on somebody and you think that person is great they might even be your friend like the Gentiles were to Peter but because you wanted to be noticed and impress the bullying, the ugly party, you go along. You allow what they're doing to happen. And that's exactly what Peter did. He didn't remain faithful and true to his own beliefs. Let's look at verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Again, Jewish customs is talking about the circumcision. Paul calls him out in front of everybody. He doesn't care who's there. He doesn't care what your rank is. He doesn't care what your status is. He could care less that you're from the Jerusalem church. He doesn't even care that you're a Gentile there. What he cares about is the right nature of things. What he cares about is exposing the hypocrisy of even his esteemed colleagues and his best friends. Can you do that? Can you hold your friends accountable? Can you call your loved ones out when they're doing wrong and acting maliciously? Or do you stand by and say nothing? Do you just let it happen? Well, we all hope that we have a Paul in our life. And maybe you have some friends that hope that you're a Paul in their life.
he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. This is in verse 13. In what sense did Christ become a curse? When God's law is broken, it imposes a curse, the judgment of God. When Christ died on the cross, a tree, it was publicly known that anyone who dies on a tree is cursed. Christ was no different. When Jesus was sacrificed on a cross, a tree, it made him cursed. And not only was that a sign of someone who was cursed, but more than that, it was a sign that Christ received God's punishment for your sin and my sin, for all of our sin. What a scene this must have been. There they were at the Antioch Christian potluck. The Gentile Christians had been asked to leave or sit in their own section. They weren't even allowed to eat the same food. I don't even know what they were eating then. But they couldn't eat what the real Christians were eating. And Peter, the honored guest, he went along with this. Barnabas, the man who led many of the Gentiles to Jesus himself, also went along with this, as, re as well as the rest of the Jews that were present there that day. And Paul, he was not having it. He was not going to stand for it. And he was not going to let his friends act this way. He was a man of accountability. He was truly called by Christ. And because this was a public affront to the Gentile Christians and a public denial of the truth of the gospel, Paul confronted Peter in a public manner. Paul reminded Peter that he himself did not live under the strict obedience of the law of Moses. Let's go back and look at this. In verse 14, he says, When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, to Peter, in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it that you force these Gentiles basically to be circumcised, to live under the Mosaic law? He calls him out in front of everybody. And how does he do this? Well, he specifically says, Peter, you eat bacon, you eat ham, you eat lobster. That is not allowed under the Jewish law. You do not keep a kosher diet, yet before these visitors, these certain esteemed people, you pretend that you follow the Jewish law all the time. You should have seen their faces. They showed surprise. What? Peter? He eats with the Gentiles? What? He's eating bacon and lobster? And can you imagine, can you envision Peter sitting there, his face all red? You probably see his heart beating fast. He might be hyperventilating a little bit. And he feels sick to his stomach. And you probably could hear a pin drop. Talk about awkward. And 
everybody else in that room is probably just wishing the whole thing would just go away. So what do you think about Paul? Did Paul do the right thing? Was Paul doing this to, to gain more status? No. Paul did it because this is what God wanted. He wanted them to be exposed for their hypocrisy. He wanted him to stand up for his people. His being God. When we accept God and Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are God's children. When we don't accept it, we're still God's children. But God will punish us. And he tells us specifically how we will be punished. Eternal damnation. And you guys, God loves us so much. He gives us opportunity after opportunity to hear his message and to accept him. Let's look at, look at verses 15 through 16. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul emphasizes, no flesh, not a Gentile, not a Jew, not anyone will be considered right before God by any other way or works but will be justified through faith all right verses 17 through 21 closing out the chapter but if in seeking to be justified in Christ we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. First of all, none of us are without sin. Our status in life, where we were born, whose family we were born into doesn't make us any better than the next person standing beside us. None of us are without sin. And he says, if we hang with those who are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. How did you come to find out? Another lost person didn't lead you in the direction of accepting the Lord. So somebody who was saved had to hang out with you. Right? Going into verse 19, For through the law... I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The law wasn't dead. There was nothing wrong with the law. The law was still active among the Jews. Male babies were circumcised. There was nothing wrong with that. There's still nothing wrong with that. But that law does not save us. The grace of God, our faith that God's grace has been given to us through the death of his son who took God's punishment for our sin. That's what saves us. That's what Paul is defending. Paul realized that the Mosaic law made him guilty before God. In other words, if he were to be circumcised, it doesn't save him. So that's why he means he died to law, the law. Because the law did not make him justified before God. And it made him see that keeping the law wasn't the answer. Now, does it mean that if someone is circumcised today, does that mean that they're not saved? No. Because the act of being circumcised or not being circumcised has nothing to do with salvation. And at this point, in our time, it's a choice. I'm going to share a couple other things with you. In verse 19, it says, What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come, the law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. What angels and mediator put the law into effect? Jews believed that angels gave the law to Moses, the mediator. Okay, so Moses was the mediator between angels and, and the people. All right, I also want you to go back and look at verse 20 this is our verse for the week I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live Christ lives in me okay when you look at me you shouldn't just see Cynthia when you look at me yes it's my face but my words, my action, my heart, my love, my compassion, you should be seeing Christ. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And when we get to chapter 5, you're going to see how this body is supposed to be living so that you see Christ. When you look at this body, there are certain fruits of the Spirit that you should see. And I cannot wait to get to that chapter because it is beautiful. And it is a reminder as Christians the way we are to act, the way we are to behave the things that should be recognizable in us. All right. I am going to um, put our prayer request up on the screen and we're going to uh, pray for these folks. We'll have a moment of silence to pray for them. 
maybe there's something on your heart that you want to give to God. Maybe there was someone you treated like Peter and Barnabas did. Maybe you weren't Paul enough for that person and you want to ask for forgiveness. Maybe you want to ask God for guidance and wisdom to maybe reach out to that person and apologize to them. Maybe you've never accepted the Lord as your personal Savior. And if that's the case, there will be a prayer listed for you to pray and say, I want to be saved. I do not want to be punished for my sin. Maybe because you acted like Peter and Barnabas, you want to give your heart back to God. And there's a prayer for you also. And if you're being a Paul and you're standing up for what's right and you're making sure everyone is treated equally, then pray for these folks that don't have a relationship with God. Pray for those that know and recognize God, but they're just not living right with Him. God calls us to love and pray for one another. Will you make that commitment today to accept Him, to come home to Him, or to pray for your fellow brothers and sisters that are lost and searching? Well, here are your prayer requests, and then we'll come back together and close out in prayer.
Father God, we just come before you today, Lord. Well, there may have been a lot of excitement and action happening in this potluck dinner in the Church of Antioch. Lord, there were some heavy truths and accountability laid out before us as well. Father, we just pray that the words we speak, the actions we show, the behaviors in which we display ourselves, never deny or keep someone from having an intimate relationship with you. May what we do and say never discourage someone. May what we say and do never confuse someone that if that's what a Christian is, I don't want anything to do with it. May the message that our lives portray be one that shows your love, your grace, your mercy. May it show how deep your love is to sacrifice your son to take punishment for all of our sin for the sin we've committed the sin we think about the sin we've yet to commit the sins of our children and their children that haven't even been born yet Jesus took that curse for us he took your punishment So may nothing we do deny someone a personal relationship with you. Lord, we have listed our friends and loved ones on our prayer list here. And we just lift them up to you, Lord, asking you to touch their lives, to answer their requests and their concerns. Lord, help us to always love one another and pray for each other father may we hold each other accountable in a loving and godly way we ask all this in your name and your son's name amen well thank you for joining me for chapter two of galatians um Next week, we are going to look at chapter three, and it is titled The Christian, the Law, and Living Faith, or Living with the Holy Spirit, or Living in the Spirit. Excuse me, I'll get it right. <laughs> um, and we'll learn a lot um, in that chapter. Um, about what God expects from us and a little bit more about accountability and again we're going to look at a little bit more about salvation compared to this mosaic law and why at the time that the law was given and the promises made were important but where does that bring us today? So I hope you'll come back and join me for that. And as we look at that, we are all one in Christ. God has no favoritism. Until then, be joyful, everyone. Have a great week, and I will see you in our next video. Bye.